Hello Earth Angels, this is Sylvia and I'm here today uh, with a beautiful friend of mine with Rob Potter. Hi Rob. How are you doing Sylvia? It's a pleasure to be here with you on your interview uh, YouTube show. Yes, um, I'm, I'm doing really good and I'm very excited today especially because it's summer solstice. Yes, yes, and, and uh, what is it, 20 minutes is and the actual 20 minutes. summer solstice. So we will be recording during the summer solstice of 2013. And another exciting thing um, is that you are driving actually to Mount Shasta. So that's another energy that is here with us. So thank you for stopping by on your way to Shasta. My pleasure. Yeah, I'm going up to Shasta. I'm doing a weekend retreat, a heart chakra opening with Andrew Bartzitz. And we're going to be uh, gathering up there in the Ascended Master Healing Room at the Power Organics. And then we're going to go up in the mountain. Um, we're probably going to head up to Panther Meadows to uh, Castle Lake in a, a little secret spot. My son was born up there uh, almost 18 years ago, so I'm kind of a local up there. And uh, we should probably give a little shout out and a, a call to heaven and the thanks for your teacher, Amora Quanyin, who passed away after a car accident on Mount Shasta and was uh, taken to a hospital uh, down south, I think UC Davis, Davis, you said, and she passed yes. away there. So uh, blessings to Amora, who we both knew from Mount Shasta. And she wrote some great books uh, uh, from the Pleiades, who she told me years ago when she first had her contact was in Laguna Beach. Right around the time Fred Bell and I were having contact is when she kind of had her opening. So that's a little uh, history for your uh, Slovakian you. friends. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, this is going to be on YouTube forever. <laughs> so, oh, good, okay. And we speak English here, so this is um, actually my first video that is going to um, reach much larger audience. And um, thanks, Rob, for mentioning Amora, because Amora Kwan Yin um, is, has been, was a great teacher that uh, transitioned now. And um, I've studied with Amora for four years at the Mystery School in Mount Shasta, so that's why I'm very excited that Rob is on the way to Mount Shasta. So Amora Kwan Yin, uh, sh she's here with us now. And uh, Yeah, they're having a, up on Sandy Flat, there was a Facebook group called, started called um, <clears throat> Summer Solstice in Shasta. Mm -hmm. And I think Kailubi's up there and uh, there's gonna be a big massive drum circle. So tomorrow night we're gonna go up there for the actual, uh, I think the full moon is tomorrow night, or is that Saturday? I'm not sure. It's a super moon, of course. The moon mm -hmm. is as close as it gets to the Earth at this time of year. So Let me look at this the Slovakian th lunar th calendar. Anyway, it's coming up soon, so we're going to be up there. We're going to have a big drum circle. and uh, Sunday. On Sunday. So, yeah, we're going to be doing some fun stuff up there with the group, um, mm -hmm. and, and it should be fun. Okay, and now, because the summer sources will be over, <laughs> full moon will be over, Mount Shasta, your trip and seminar will be over, but what will, what will be here forever is light, energy, God, and all of those exciting things we're going to talk about. Yes, absolutely. We are the light, we love the light, and we serve the light. We do. So, Rob is my guest today for um, a very important reason because he knows a lot he's been through a lot and he has a lot to offer so mm -hmm. rab uh, can Thank you tell you. us uh, <laughs> a little bit about you about um, um you meeting pleading princess semiasa in laguna beach where there is a big pleading vortex and your experience with her okay um well i have to say uh, a lot of my story is on the promise revealed.com i have a lot of work to do there a lot of things need to be changed. I, um, as typical with light workers, we don't have a lot of money, and I'm not very good at the internet. So I'm going to be updating that stuff. Um, and the event we're doing is going to be live streamed on Wolf Spirit Radio. It'll be uh, Andrew Bartsitz and Rob Potter and Shasta, so you can see that there. But my history starts uh, from a long, long time ago. It's kind of on my website, and there's lots of interviews where I've talked about it. But I'll be very brief with it. Um, I, it's kind of hard to be brief, I guess. <laughs> no, I'm smiling. Knowing me. But um, when I was young, um, I was very interested in pyramids. And um, We have one here. We, we I'm, I'm going to be your assistant. Just talk to Okay, we have a couple you. pyramids here. which, uh, And one of the girls at my uh, school that I went to said, Oh, I know the Pyramid Man. And so I went up the hill and I met Dr. Fred Bell when he made... He was actually coming in the house with his first 
run of 50 pyramids. Who's Dr. Fred Bell? Can you tell our viewers that? Fred Bell is actually uh, a friend of mine. He passed away. He wrote some great books. Uh, one uh, called Death of Ignorance, which is excellent in 1979. And the uh, next one was Rays of Truth and Crystals of Light. And he wrote another one called The Inside Track. But The Rays of Truth and Crystals of Light was his best book, clearly. And his history is, is very kind of unique. His, uh, one of his relatives was named Ethan Allen and was very much involved in the um, Revolutionary War. One of the first people to fire upon the British and the Green Mountain Boys. Um, uh, they basically started the revolution against the British and said enough is enough. And um, his, his another famous relative uh, who invented the telephone named Alexander Graham Bell. That was his great uncle. Mm -hmm. And his father also was a very famous engineer. His father worked, his name was Alan Bell, and he worked for Henry Ford. He helped Henry Ford. Together, they created the alternator and the automatic transmission. Wow. He also bought the London Bridge over. So Fred grew up running through the hemp fields of Henry Ford, and he was delivered by Henry Ford's doctor in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And at a very early age, he understood science and mechanics. Uh, Bob Johnson and Bob McCullough of McCulloch Engines, uh, boat engines, actually used to bounce him on his knee. And uh, he was fixing radio and television sets, the little tiny screens with the big things when he was eight years old. Mm -hmm. uh, at uh, 10 years old, he was, um, you know, building transistor radios from scratch. So he was a kind of a scientific electrical genius. And um, at the age of 15, he was invited to work at the University of Michigan under Leonard Katz, where he studied the shockwave of the atomic bomb and observed uh, they had a, uh, a linear accelerator there. He was looking at what's called a, um, um, a Wilson cloud chamber. And in there, he got some ideas about healing and stuff. And th he was inducted, conscripted, actually, into the Air Force when he was... Uh, 16 before he was 17 they took him into the ROTC program and he got a PhD in physics I think um, at 17 years old and then as soon as he graduated he went into the Air Force uh, he did his basic training I think in Arkansas and then he moved out to Point Reyes California where he was working on the top radar sets in 1963 during the Cuban Missile Crisis so what happened was is he saw the UFOs coming in and they were burning up the reports and he said, you can't do that. They said, oh, yes, we can. And he made a big stink about it. He started throwing back uh, regulations, you know, saying that you have to report this. And they said, are you going to make trouble? He goes, yeah, this is not right. And um, good for him. And he ended up, um, they kind of were freaking out. So he pretended he wanted to get away from them. So he told me he faked like he took hydrochloric acid and ate it. He didn't. But they called the crazy farm and they put him, took him away in a straitjacket, and then he got to the uh, uh, mental hospital, and he said, look, I'm completely straight. I just wanted to get out of there. I didn't want them to do anything. So, look, you tell them um, to give me an honorable discharge, and we're done. So at that point, uh, he left the um, uh, military, and um, he started uh, what's called, he called it Scope, uh, let's see, uh, I forget the name of his company, but he started a company using, utilizing oscilloscopes and became uh, doing a lot of contracts uh, with the U.S. government um, where he was uh, uh, diagnosing their equipment. Then he went, went to work for on the Saturn, Gemini, and Apollo missions at NASA under Werner von Braun, and then um, he complained that some problems were taking place in the electrical engineering on the Gemini, and they said, are you going to make trouble? And he said, yeah, this is shoddy workmanship. And he reported it, and they fired him. Three men died on the Cape in the exact area where he said. He had a suit going with the ACLU. He won that suit and ended up um, getting some money. He, they, they offered to make him the head of safety and the head of this and that. And he said no, and he went to work in the private sector under JPL and um, uh, McDonnell Douglas or something. I forget. Who, no, not McDonnell Douglas. Um, another company in aerospace. So he was working for them. So when I met him, he had just finished his teachings with an Indian master named Syringe of Arroy. He was called Father. He was a Rajput prince from India. And he wrote a very uh, beautiful series of dissertations, and I'll, uh, 
I'll, uh, I have a copy maybe I'll photoscap photocopy for you. you can have it maybe share it with people okay. it's a beautiful dissertation on light uh, yoga power truth and um, a beautiful dissertation when I met him I never saw him speak I met him five times and he was in his probably late 60s and 70s then and he sat in a full lotus and he just laughed he had a big beard his name was Surinder Varoy very powerful kind of Sadhguru type being mm -hmm. he ended up fathering uh, many children and he came to America and he started an ashram in 1966 on Hayton Waller where's that San Francisco okay. the the side door was Haight Ashbury so he was the guru that started the flower children movement mm -hmm. and um, so Fred went through initiation there and the girlfriend he was with that at that time her name was Louise Karen when I met him and uh, he called her bunny and she was a very sweet girl and when I'd come up to the house she would say how was your day Rob did you devote all of it so she learned a lot from father and and Fred um, was given a task of holding down a vortex uh, in Laguna Beach and he had been having some experiences with some extraterrestrials right before I had met him in 1973 so right around then uh, he was having some UFO experiences he didn't talk about them much at that time so he uh, was told by the uh, Tibetan Dwal Kul to build a gold pyramid which he did and he didn't know what to do with it and a little kid little baby crawled up and put the pyramid on his head so that's where we got what's called the pyridome that we put on our head and this is the beginning of the uh, pyramids on the head now pyramids are basically themselves portals and they actually take the earth's magnetism into seven levels just like a prism does with light, the pyramid does that with magnetism. Here's the first ray, will and power. Mm -hmm. Second ray, love, wisdom. Third ray, active intelligence. Fourth ray, harmony through conflict. The fifth ray, concrete science and knowledge. The sixth ray, abstract idealism and devotion. And the seventh ray, ceremonial order and magic. And those are the seven rays of creation, or in the Bible, they're called the seven spirits before the throne. All the different religions have reference to these ancient understandings and technologies which have we've kind of lost here. So when I met Fred, um, uh, he told me to read the book Initiation, Human and Solar, and he gave me the book Autobiography of a Yogi, and those two books uh, kind of started me on my spiritual path. And from then I, I served him for many years developing these pyramid products, um, and he would have experiences with Semyasi. And as time grew on... Uh, Semyasi is a Pleiadian being. The Pleiadian being mm -hmm. that Billy Meyer uh, had contact with. Coming over to his house, we had Lee and Britt Elders, and we were in contact with Colonel Stevens, um, who did the book, The Contact from the Pleiades. And um, so at the age of 17, I was getting Billy Meyer's notes hot off the presses. I was sitting down for hours from Colonel wow. getting notes from Colonel Stevens and just reading Bill everything. Bill Meyer lives in Europe somewhere now. He's in Switzerland, yeah. Switzerland, uh, Hinter, Hinter Schmerdy or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or a lot of the pictures were taken there. I forget the name. He has a Semyasi start center and uh, uh, unfortunately um, Billy felt like uh, that he she said that told him he would be the only physical contact which he probably was for a certain period of time except for secret government contacts which she had ongoing as part of her mission but she didn't tell him everything some of it was for safety but uh, he did mention she did say except for spurious scientific contacts so uh, there was a time in uh, Garmisch Partkirchen, which is near Switzerland. Fred was doing a uh, uh, a concert and talking about Semyasi. And Billy Myers, people, the Guido Musburger, the the butcher, came, and a couple of the other people saying, "You don't know Semyasi, blah blah blah." She made a big stink out of it. And while he was giving a concert, Semyasi's ship came over. Hmm. People ran out from the concert. There were pictures taken. Hundreds of people saw the ship. Swiss jets were uh, and German jet air fighters were flying across the sky in Garmisch Parkkirchen and it's recorded they, the military cordoned off the town and um, so Semyasi pretty much laid to rest any doubts at that point the okay. day the people were claiming he didn't have contact she appeared above the uh, stadium or the uh, concert hall where uh, Fred did his uh, thing 
Uh, I, we traveled, did many uh, tours together for many years, and I worked with Fred. And um, it culminated, I was having many out-of-body experiences with Fred in the house. Uh, we would create these pyramid. Semyasi was giving us, in 1980, we just had a laser and a crystal and maybe one or two pyramids. She was giving us a series, giving Fred actually, Fred took dictation from her on a series of uh, designs with pyramids to actually create scalar waves in conjunction with negative ion generators and I actually am carrying on that work. Um, um, he's passed away and... Um, when did he pass away? Uh, in 2011. Mm -hmm. Well, actually I have uh, I have one thing here yeah. that Rob can talk about. This is uh, also Fred Bell's... There's 144 pyramids here in a concentric design and if you can look it's it's kind of shaped like a satellite dish if you let's pull it back and see uh -huh. the it's yeah. like a, it's like a little dish and um, actually there's 144 pyramids in the Fibonacci spiral there and you have a gemstone on there uh -huh. that filters and uh, uh, the the science of electrical precursation we have so many hostile vibrational technologies assaulting our spiritual consciousness which is our DNA the light within us is mm -hmm. a basically a, a vibratory frequency of light it's a crystal our DNA is made of a, of, of a crystal literally and it's attuned to the divine I am presence the divine source of God and yet as we know we have a hostile force that's been involved on the planet for 26,000 years and the planet is in is in a dire situation that needs healing and so we have things assaulting our DNA. We have several things going on. We have harp, we have chemtrails, we have vaccinations, we have cell phones, we have genetically altered food, we have uh, fluoride, uh, to name a few. We also have an electronic fence of mind control entrainment being broadcast across the uh, television waves uh, that basically are designed to entrain and distract the human consciousness. So not only that, but we have smog, we have toxic chemicals, all of these things assault our DNA. And what happens is, is our DNA is like a, a ladder, okay? And then you, it has twists. You take the ladder and you twist it. And between each twist, there's a certain number of DNA. And when each cell replicates, and this happens about 50 million times perhaps in a second through the body, these DNAs unwind, and each of these cells call out to the body and they replicate themselves. So what happens is, is as we get older, the steps in the ladder become shortened. So each cell doesn't have the same information that it had. When you were a young child, you know, the first breath you took, you probably went down to 46 base pairs per turn. You know, by the time you're uh, 20 years old, you're down to maybe 25 base pairs per turn. And time you're 50, you've maybe only got six or eight base pairs per turn. So each cell is losing its information. We're not replicating properly because of the assault on our DNA and all the toxic stress. And we literally take some of these vibrations within to our body and our cellular structure and the mass of the cell. These are called antigens and free radicals, trap proteins, which in inhibit the cellular process. So much of uh, Semyasi's work and the Pleiadians' work was involved in the biochemical process of liberation and the life extension through utilizing various natural organic herbs and substances in conjunction with vibrational therapy. And we found that lasers, Shul Semyasi told us lasers and crystals are very important. In fact, the quartz crystal is the perfect synthesis of spirit and matter in zero time. So by utilizing these technologies, we created an artificial portal within his house. And so... In Fred Bell's house. In Fred Bell's house. So he would call me up at certain times, like the solstice of the full moons. And this is to work in harmony with the natural forces of the universe, where it would be easier to exit the body. And the, and the, and the Pleiadians were around. He wasn't telling me this exactly. But we'd go through a series of... I'm going to call them for this particular interview, uh, esoteric um, uh, manipulations of consciousness that brought about changes and I would leave my body. And the, 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 the Pleiadians would be right there and I would literally watch the earth disappear and I would go out of my body and I was having experiences. 
I would come down and Fred would make a bath for me and I'd go in an Epsom salt bath to ground myself out and I would go to home and as I went down the hill I would see the lights they'd be following me so for many years I was kind of like wondering what the heck is going on he wasn't talking about UFOs at this type he was talking about spiritual consciousness and I started to get into UFOs in like 81 82 I was really learning a lot and he finally gave a lecture on UFOs and was looking at me okay I'm going to tell you he says UFOs are all about the earth and all this stuff so um, basically I had a um, I, I've been always asking these lights. I was crying. I was having kind of an emotional reaction to not knowing. And I was calling to them. I just want to know, is that you, Simyasi? And the light would get brighter. And they would put fog around. And they'd come closer. And I had many experiences with girls uh, and things like uh, we're sitting like you and I are now. And the light would coming in. And I would tell them about the UFOs. And i go, that's a ship right there. And she mm -hmm. goes, really? And the, the ship would come down. It went down along, I had a telephone line, power line. It came down along the power line. It went along the power line. We could see it, just a little bit of the light on either side of the line. Then it came up, and it went to the top of the pole. And then it came up and said hello and went down. And, and this one girl, her name was Charlene, she said, whoa. <laughs> so they basically, that was part of, that was in the early years of what I call my identification process, mm -hmm. where I came to understand uh the technology they have and the humility that is involved in uh, in their interaction with us and the compassion that they have when they observe us because mm -hmm. when you understand they see and know everything that you do and think and that um, you know sometimes it's embarrassing <laughs> like some of the things uh, that were going on in my life and I would get like a like a telepathic or an energetic contact which for me I was never like super telepathic or anything but I, I got a sense of like they were like going like dude what are you doing <laughs> like you're getting way out there you know and I was like uh, kind of embarrassing you know so um, you kind of have uh, to find your own moral compass and spiritual compass for uh, how you uh, live your life and how you uh, serve the light but um, it culminated one day in a actual physical beam out from Fred's living room and um, I believe I, I met her I believe that uh, she came into the house sometimes, uh, and I think I know who she was, but I don't know for sure, because uh, it, she w it wouldn't say, but I had a strong feeling it was her. Very beautiful, very beautiful girl. Um, almost as beautiful as you, Sylvia. Thank you. Anyway, she uh, was very beautiful, and um, I think that was her, but the particular time that I ha went out, uh, I came back we were standing in a different place of the room and Fred was very happy he was standing next to me he said and he looked at me and I remembered everything I knew I just left the ship I remember they had showed me many things I know that I had an intimate interaction and uh, he looked at me and said you're the master now and I watched as everything all the experiences left me except the very end I remember I had made a promise to Semyasi and so um, you basically would, didn't remember what happened you just know that you were there that you went out of your body and I knew that I went in my, I knew I went in the ship mm -hmm. I, I remembered the whole experience for a moment and all I came down to was like the very end I don't remember the specifics mm -hmm. and uh, because I actually was in a different location when I showed up I'm standing in his living room it's 5 in the morning and I left it was 11.30 at night oh. and he had pushed on my back which is um a way to shift the attention so there was an esoteric aspect to uh, exiting the body and but this particular time I took they took my whole body boom we were gone and um, he had asked her many times for me in particular for others to be witness and she said absolutely not another time we went into the desert we were driving to New York to one of our shows so you crisscrossed the country with the National Health Federation and the whole life expo for many years and uh, we went out into the desert and um, he said let's stop and Fred never stopped when we went across country he was like get in the car we'd go for 24 36 hours straight mm. so we stopped and 
I go, what are we doing here? <clears throat> they put a sleep beam on me and his girlfriend, and we were out. And then he came back in. He was all excited. He goes, okay. And he had this, like, radiant glow. Uh -huh. Like, another time when he was beamed up in her ship, he had the same energy, very high spiritual consciousness radiating from mm -hmm. him. And um, he said, let's go. He didn't tell me about it till years later. I read it in the book. I mean, he, Fred was so secretive, it's ridiculous. Some people think Cobra is secretive. Fred was redonkulous about it. It's just, we'll talk about Cobra in part two. <laughs> yeah, part okay? two. This is part one. But um, so basically we're driving out on this thing, and all of a sudden there's two military jeeps there. And I had lit some incense before. And he goes, don't light incense. And I go, why not? You always want incense in the van. It's just not now. And sure enough, we come up on the corner and there's military jeeps. And they're looking at, who are you, where are you? And I'm like thinking, what are military jeeps doing on this sandy road off of the 395? It was really kind of strange to me. I was kind of perplexed by the whole situation. And uh, so years later, I found out this was the time that Semyasi directed him to land. And she let him actually fly the ship. Hmm. And uh, the, the ship, when they fly, there's actually a device like that mm -hmm. and the like the one. the captain puts their hand over the ship each interesting i'll tell you some interesting stuff about the pleiadian ships which is kind of a fun technology which we're going to get very quickly here on the earth but the ship itself is attuned to the aura of the captain it actually has a programmed consciousness of the captain and uh, if you were to go on the ship the ship could talk to you and interact with you in the captain's voice with the captain's sense of humor and the captain could actually program in jokes or whatever you want so no one's going to steal a pleiadian ship because it'll only be started by the captain of the ship uh, number two they would put their hand over that that device and that's how they would guide the ship he told me number three when they um land on their planet on the planet era, um, their landing. What is planet era? That's a, in the Pleiades. It's one of the planets okay. in the, in the Pleiades. So when they land there, their spaceports actually are kind of shaped like nautilus shells, and they're actually acoustically designed. So when you hear a spaceship sound, it is actually the aura of the spaceship commander, and they can actually make their own music so the spaceship comes down and goes Wee -oo! they can if they want to think of whatever harmony they want whatever they're feeling it projects and they can turn up the volume on their ship so so the um, spaceport is like a musical concert when they land so it's kind of an interesting thing so they have uh, wonderful technologies he was given the secret to the interstellar conversion process which is a beam ship technology basically utilizing uh, counter-rotating magnet fields and other advanced technologies, which um, kind of involved to go into there. But um, we had a, a, an on and off association for many years. I love Fred very much, and I always served him. I painted his house on numerous times. I was with him more than uh, all of his uh, wives, except for Frauke. I probably knew him longer. She lived with him quite a long time. That was his third wife, mm -hmm. and uh, I, uh, of his four daughters, I knew three of them uh, and held them in my arms, probably all of them within uh, 72 hours of their birth. And uh, one of them is actually trying to carry on the legacy, and unfortunately um, we had a little disagreement about some of the commission she made an agreement and kind of withdrew, so I decided to make my own pyramids and uh, sell my own products. And uh, she's a little mad at me right now, but... I love it her. It can change, you know. So. I know it will. It's okay. It's just it's business. But uh, one of the things with Fred was uh, he had some issues around money. I guess I have I have a lot of issues around money too. I guess that's probably my big button to get pushed. But Fred wasn't always the most. Uh, you know, he's passed away now. I'm not going to go into details. But there were some. He had some reneging situations with me, and I wasn't going to go through it with his daughter. So. We, we broke off, but the technology is around, and uh, the foundation was laid by him, and I'm doing my best to carry the torch and the legacy of healing. And there's other technologies. Well, it, that, that's what I was going to say, because this is Cobra, right? This, this is this is Cobra. So this is a teaser for part two, because I think we should take a break now, so the videos okay. are not too long, because we're reaching Is it the solstice? Minutes. It's a, We're in the we're, solstice. We are in the solstice, yay! And we'll see you in part two.